This week on Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News, religion offers spirituality, ritual, and belonging. But for some Christians, their beliefs on LGBTQ plus rights conflict with church teachings. The inner struggle it takes to deconstruct your faith, it's not easy. There's so much grief and pain and shame. I hear it almost weekly. I hear folks that have gone through that same journey of deconstruction, the sense of alienation. Today, we explore one reason why more people are leaving the Christian faith. It is our responsibility to be open to all people. And what it means for a church to be affirming of everyone. Welcome to Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. I'm Colorado Public Radio's Nathan Heffel. And I'm Denver 7's Micah Smith. Each week in a partnership between Denver 7 and CPR, we have a real talk about issues impacting underrepresented people across Colorado and amplifying voices you may not always hear. And today we're talking about religion, specifically Christianity in the U.S., and why many people are leaving or changing their affiliation and building new traditions. Earlier this year, the Public Religion Research Institute released a survey of more than 5,600 adults. It highlights what's known as religious churning when someone chooses a different religious path. And the survey explores different reasons why it's on the rise. We're going to get perspective on one in particular, LGBTQ plus rights and inclusion. You'll hear from a Coloradan who left their religion in just a bit. But first, let's get some insight with an expert from the Iliff School of Theology in Denver. The Reverend Dr. Amanda Henderson directs the Institute for Religion, Politics, and Culture, and she says for at least 30 years, the debate over LGBTQ inclusion has grown within Christian communities. And so when we peel that back, it's important to understand, one, that the Bible actually has very little to say about homosexuality. There are seven texts that get pulled apart by biblical scholars, and those are very contextual and not very clear. In terms of official church doctrine, the Catholic Church does still hold an official doctrine that says that homosexuality is a sin. Their doc- doctrine is rooted more in a hate the sin, love the sinner kind of um, posture. Henderson says that there is a range of views within Christian denominations, churches, and communities, and that many congregations have their own statements of belief. That brings us to a key stat from the survey we mentioned before. When it comes to why some people leave their religion, nearly half cited negative treatment of LGBTQ people. That's especially true for younger respondents, primarily those in their 20s, followed by those in their 30s and 40s. So let's have a real talk with Alex Floyd of Denver. They're 33 and their own experience reflects this reality. Alex, thank you so much for joining us for this real talk. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Where did you grow up and how did that shape your religious beliefs early on? Yeah, so I grew up in a really small town, um, a very small, isolated town in Michigan. Uh, Very conservative, very like, quote unquote, idealistic on the outside. Um, Very Christian based town. Even before we started going to church regularly when I was pretty young, it was just in the water. Everyone was assumed to be a Christian. And and what made you start to feel differently when it came to Christianity? I think that was a long process. One of the bigger factors was I'm a social worker. I have my master's in social work. And as part of your master's training, you do a lot of internships, real world experience. And my town was probably 99% like white middle class uh, individuals. And so getting out of that town, getting into these different experiences, meeting people who had different stories than I did, I started to realize a lot of things I was taught around like self-reliance, independence, being able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, all those things did not hold up in the real world. Mm. As someone who grew up in the Christian faith myself, I know a lot of times the doctrine says you'll be tested. When you get in the real world, you'll be tested. How did you come to the understanding of, no, I'm not being tested. This teaching actually conflicts with who I am. I mean, I think that's a great point um, because that that does come up a lot. Like the inner struggle it takes to deconstruct your faith is a lot. It's not easy. And so I went through phases, right? I grew up very uh, fundamentalist conservative. I went to a, like a liberal Christian phase. I And then eventually I realized that there's just fundamental things about Christian faith, even those that are accepting of LGBTQ plus individuals that I just don't agree with. I don't believe people are inherently sinful. I don't, I can't align with a God that like 
punishes half of their creation for all of eternity. Like those things just don't align with my values anymore. And so ultimately for my own sake and my own health, I, I had to walk away from all that. Growing up as you did and discovering that you were different, I remember when I came out as gay and I was discovering that I was gay, that there was this internal struggle. And you had on top of that the external struggle of saying this church may or may not jive with what I'm feeling. How did that work as a kid? I mean, I think for a long time it just kept me in the closet, right? And it kept me unaware of my own desires and things that brought me joy because externally from the church, I was told this is how things are and this is what your life will look like. And it's a very prescriptive lifestyle. And so I learned very quickly to just disconnect from myself and follow that prescription. And so as I started to kind of come back to myself and discover these things about myself, it was it was a big struggle. Um, and like memories almost started to come back to of like remembering how much I was terrified I was gay as a kid which I don't I don't think a lot of people who are straight have that fear right and so I did a lot of like I would have those fear thoughts and then it was almost like self-conversion therapy of like praying to God like don't let this be true look at this cute boy over here like clearly I'm straight like really trying to like force that internal narrative um and I never told that to anyone growing up like that was just kind of a secret that I kept to myself yeah wow Well, given that internal struggle, how easy or hard was it to ultimately say, I need to leave this religion that I grew up in? It was incredibly hard. And I think, you know, I heard this when I was in the church and I've heard it outside of the church. There's this belief that people who are walking away from the church just didn't have a strong faith. They didn't have a real relationship with Jesus. All of these things that are said and like, that's not true. Everyone I know who has had been on this journey, we were in, we were all in. That was our world. That was our community. That was everything. And that process of walking away, I mean, it took years. It wasn't like I just woke up one day and was like, the church doesn't welcome me as a queer person, so I'm just not going to go anymore. Mm. Like it was years of learning from others, deconstruction. There's so much grief and pain and shame to unpack in that journey. Like it's not, it's not easy. There's, I still, hold a lot of grief to this day when I think about it. Is there spirituality now in your life? Do you have that? Yeah, I think for a while there wasn't. For a while I just had to walk away from everything. But now for me, it looks a lot like maybe a more general belief, a much more open, like there's probably some sort of energy um, out there. There's just, I've had a lot of experiences that feel very magical or mystical to me. Um, And I don't want to let go of that. I don't have a desire to. And so now I find a lot of that in nature. I find a lot of that in just like the creation of this world and the way that nature evolves and grows and all of the really cool things about that um, gives me that similar feeling of like mysticism and peace and it's also a place that I can learn. I can learn a lot from nature um, and that's just freely accessible to me. It's just there. Well, thank you for taking us through kind of the evolution of your beliefs and it's just beautiful to hear that it's kind of come full circle in a way. Yeah. But Alex Floyd of Denver, thank you so much for joining us for this Real Talk. Absolutely. So what does it mean for a church to be welcoming, more accepting, and affirming to the LGBTQ plus community? Coming up, an affirming Colorado church leader on what guides their congregation's practices and beliefs. Stay with us. This is Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. Welcome back to Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. I'm Denver 7's Micah Smith. And I'm Colorado Public Radio's Nathan Heffel. Imagine what it feels like to be raised in a community, learning their values and traditions, only to be told later that it's just not a place for you or for someone you love. For a growing number of Christians, being LGBTQ or supporting LGBTQ rights have left them feeling alienated from the religion they grew up in. Many of them have simply left and now identify as unaffiliated when it comes to their faith. But what about worshipers who still wish to be part of a church community? Joining us now is Reverend Mark Feldmeyer. He's a minister at St. Andrew United Methodist Church in Highlands Ranch. Reverend Feldmeyer, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Thanks. We just heard from Alex about what led them to leave their Christian church. How often do you hear similar stories from others who visit your church? I hear it almost weekly, to be honest. I hear folks that um, have gone through that same journey of deconstruction, the sense of alienation and estrangement from their faith communities, 
folks that are looking for new pathways of spirituality and new communities and Every once in a while, they stumble across St. Andrew and find a safe sanctuary. This word deconstruction, I, I think it, it may be well known in, in the church community. Can you explain a little bit about that? It, it seems so raw when someone says, I have to deconstruct my life. Correct. It's a, it's a process of, uh, of taking an assessment of the totality of one's beliefs and come to terms with that which we, we can no longer accept as as reasonable and comfortable within our uh, faith system and learning to accept the fact that we we can let go of some things and embrace new realities in our in our faith system mm. can you give us some background on the methodist faith how it started and how that gave root to your church's beliefs and practices today yeah methodism emerged out of the uh, mid 18th century out of england out of the church of england came to uh to north america and really is grounded in, um, in a movement of both personal piety and, and inner uh, faith development, but also a real commitment to social justice. And so Methodism in its earliest roots and continues today to be grounded in uh, efforts to feed the hungry, to educate those who, um, who are illiterate early in those, in those uh, days and to uh, care for the sick. And so um, that's, that's the DNA of the Methodist movement and continues even today. Is there also a sense of scholarship of understanding and reading the texts of the Bible and how that may change over generations? Is that, is that also part of it? Absolutely, and, and, and Methodists are known for a, a rigorous study of Scripture that transcends a more literalist uh, interpretation of Scripture. And I like to say that we approach Scripture through the lens of love understanding that that love transcends the law and so my approach to scripture uh, is one that um, that tries to follow and model the approach of Jesus particularly in the in the uh, Gospel of Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus reinterprets some of those laws around adultery around around greed around revenge and eye for an eye and he basically says you have heard that it was said of old but I say to you now and he reinterprets Hebrew law through the lens and the law of love. We talked about the word deconstructing, but there are two other words that tend to come up when we talk about this topic, and that is affirming and reconciling. Can you help us understand those words and what they mean for you and St. Andrew? The word reconciling specifically relates to the United Methodist Church and a designation that gets to the heart of the debate within our denomination uh, that, that goes to our Book of Discipline, our Constitution, that addresses language in our Constitution in which the statement says that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. The reconciling movement within a Methodist denomination is trying to reconcile those two statements to say there's no longer any incompatibility between those two statements. Affirming takes uh, the next step in saying that every person bears the image and sacred worth of God, and there are no distinctions based on sexual orientation or gender identity. On your website, you mentioned something called radical hospitality. I love that. How else do you practice what you preach when someone who may be coming into your church who is LBGTQ+, is it, is it a don't ask, don't tell? Is it a, how, how do you approach that? Every Sunday, I begin with a, a very clear statement of welcome, which says, uh, no matter who you are, or what you believe, or who you love, you are welcome here, and you are affirmed here, and you belong here. Mm -hmm. And we try to practice and model that by ensuring that there are no barriers whatsoever to participation and, and, and leadership in, in our congregation. And that means that you can, you can receive communion or you can serve communion. You can teach a class, you can be a part of a class. You can serve in any way in leadership up and down the organization in our community with no barriers whatsoever. And what about the makeup of leadership and clergy at St. Andrew? Can you tell us about that? Indeed, we have always made a concerted effort to center voices that are LGBTQ+. And so we have clergy on our team that are open and out, and we have uh, members up and down our staff and our leadership of laity who are also out as well. And we are proudly uh, affirming in that way as well. What do you tell somebody, whether in or outside your congregation, who's maybe struggling with accepting someone who's LGBTQ or plus? 
Again, I get this quite a bit, folks who are in this uh, journey, uh, as so many are today, and trying to process what it means when their own children or grandchildren come out. And I try to begin with understanding the incredible amount of courage it takes for especially a young person to come out to their parents. I try to remind parents and grandparents it takes a lot of courage for that conversation to start and to create safe space for those parents then to process with me, not only as a pastor of an affirming congregation, but also as a parent of a child who is out and gay as well. Mark Feldmeyer is the lead pastor at St. Andrew United Methodist Church in Highlands Ranch. Thank you so much, Reverend, for joining us for this Real Talk. Great. Up next, we'll visit another Colorado church whose stance in LGBTQ rights used to be basically don't ask, don't tell. But those views have evolved. Find out why as we continue this Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. Welcome back to Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. I'm Nathan Haffel. And I'm Micah Smith. It's not easy to change long-held beliefs, but that's what started to happen at one Denver Baptist church. I'll take you there to find out more in just a minute. But first, let's revisit the 2024 survey from the Public Religion Research Institute. When it comes to those surveyed who no longer identify with their childhood religion, nearly half cited the treatment of LGBTQ plus folks as a reason why. The survey also highlights those who identify as religiously unaffiliated. This includes atheists and agnostics, but most Americans in this category do believe in God or a higher power. And get this, when it comes to religious beliefs, the largest group is now those who are religiously unaffiliated. That's more than a quarter of Americans, and of those who left a religious tradition, most were either formerly Catholic or mainline Protestant. Now, Jewish Americans, on the other hand, have a relatively strong retention rate into adulthood, or around 77%. The only religious group with a higher retention rate in this survey? Black Protestants. And that leads us to our next guest to continue this real talk on LGBTQ inclusion and Christianity. I visited New Hope Baptist Church in Denver and spoke with Reverend Eugene Downing about his own transformation of beliefs. Reverend Downing, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Micah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. So this episode, we're talking about the LGBTQ plus community and Christianity. Uh, We are inside New Hope Baptist Church, your church, and we know this is a welcoming place for the LGBTQ plus community, but how did you get to this space? Yeah, well, thank you for asking that, and I think it's a really relevant question. I think we got to this space by honestly just following the command of Christ, right? So that while in sort of the public sphere, the conversation about the LGBTQ plus community has become a popular one, the reality is that there are people in the LGBTQ plus community who you know, been around for quite some time. And so for us, it's not necessarily new. And what we see is, is our responsibility to be open to all people. And that as Christ would have it, that it's difficult for all to be saved if all aren't welcome. And so we just found that as our sort of beginning uh, steps into engaging the entire community that's around us. Yeah, that's a big step because yeah. in, in the black community, I mean, there's research that backs this up. That's not necessarily the case when it comes to being welcoming specifically to the LGBTQ plus community. Yeah, I mean, I do understand that to be the case. It's tough because every one of our families, every facet of our community uh, is comprised of a variety of people, right? We're not a monolith. And so, um, yeah, it's tough, but we stepped into the space as a result of the incident we saw uh, unfold in Colorado Springs the shooting at Club Q nightclub and decided at that point that we needed at least to have a conversation. But I think even before that, the congregation was welcoming. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between open and affirming and welcoming. Talk to me about that. Yeah. So I say the congregation was welcoming long before I arrived here in the sense that, to my knowledge, New Hope never, you know, refused or sort of ran away, if you will, those who were in LGBTQ plus community. And then at the onset of the incidents we've seen, not just at uh, Club Q, but around the country in the last several years, we decided to have a conversation. And so we uh, held a conversation with our our leaders of the fellowship. It was facilitated by Bishop Kim Lucas, the uh, Bishop of the Episcopal Church of Colorado. 
and we actually just had a sit down dialogue about uh, what we believe our responsibility as Christians is as it relates to welcoming all and particularly welcoming those who are hurting, welcoming those who are uh, impacted by violence in our community, who are marginalized, who are disenfranchised socially in the example of Christ. So throughout the New Testament, we see Jesus going to people who are literally socially ostracized and pulling them in. And so we found that to be simply following the model of Christ. What has been the response from your congregation? Are there people who say this goes against our teachings or this goes against the Bible? Yeah, we, we have not had that as a response at the same time. I mean, we haven't like, you know, rolled out a flag or laid out, you know, a carpet to you know, make an announcement about it. I think what we have done is make space in the congregation for all people. And to this point, no, we've, we've had, I will say, first of all, I've had parents approach me appreciative um, because as you well know, that we have a generation of young people who are wrestling with identity, some wrestling with identity. And as a result of that wrestling and ha not having a place to go with that wrestling are going through a myriad of real serious challenges to the extreme of taking their own lives, to the lesser end of just wrestling through their adolescent and young adult years. Yeah. Reverend Downing, are there parameters around this acceptance, I guess? <laughs> I mean, no. I mean, um, I, I, I would say we are really early in the journey, um, but you know, I, I wouldn't say that we have any parameters uh, other than simply genuinely trying to love other people. It's interesting just to hear about your journey because mm -hmm. it's clear that, I mean, Christianity as a whole has mm -hmm. come a long way, but hearing mm -hmm. what's happening here at New Hope in a historically black community, yeah. in a historically black church yeah. is huge. It is, and to your point earlier, you know, there are some stigmas in historic communities and traditional churches, but one of the wonderful things I love about this congregation is that despite what is known to be traditional in terms of the social mores and folkways, that I believe we are a fellowship that is genuinely seeking Christ and genuinely attempting to love all who come to our doors. All right, Reverend Downing, thank you for joining us thank for you, this Micah. Real Talk. Thank you. <laughs> Micah, this whole episode has just been absolutely amazing in terms of these, these stories of people leaving their faith coming to their faith, changing their beliefs around their faith uh, in regard to this issue. It's just absolutely fascinating. It is, and I'm really grateful to everybody who was vulnerable enough to share their religious journey with us because this is not an easy thing to actually go through, but then to share it essentially with the world is a whole other task. So we are so grateful to everyone who joined us for this yeah, real talk. It was a real talk. It was. <laughs> <laughs> and that is this episode of Real Talk with Denver 7 and CPR News. Every week, we have a real talk on issues that impact Coloradans who are often overlooked. You can find all of our episodes on denver7.com slash realtalk or at cpr.org slash realtalk. Have a great day.